Hello everyone, my name is Laura Studillo Mesías and I come from the United Nations Environment Program. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are. I'm sure you heard about the UN, but the Environment Program is just kind of a, a part of it. We're part of the Secretariat, but we're an independent uh, institution, uh, which basically is the environmental consciousness of the United Nations. We were founded 50 years ago. And what we want is to advocate for sustainable development. And right now we're mainly focusing on what solutions can we bring to the three planetary crises that the earth is suffering right now, which are climate change, uh, biodiversity loss and pollution. And how, do, and how do we do that? We basically work with all stakeholders to promote solutions and also do a lot of research and investigation on what are the causes and what can actually be effective to combat all the problems that we're facing. So I work specifically with the team of Sustainable Life Sales and Education. We are a small program within the uh, Sustainable Consumption and Production Unit. Uh, so basically what we do is work on the part that talks about how we are living, how and what does influence the way we live. Uh, thankfully, we have kind of have seen a uh, raise in interest in the environment, environmental issues through the years, and actually even within the part on how do us as individuals have a role within the system. And we can see that with this uh, statement from the Secretary General, who directly mentioned sustainable lifestyles and how having those choices and the ability to have a sustainable life because it's not really something that you just choose to have, but it's something that has to be available to you through the government you're, you're living in, through the available services and products, and also through your own decisions. So this means not only better policies, but also better products and services, and as well, a civil society that is willing to undertake change. So we're going to talk about household consumptions and sustainable lifestyles. Um, why are we talking about that? Because you know there is a lot of focus on the production side and how the way we're doing things, the way we produce our products and services is unsustainable and very resource intensive. However, and that's how the focus is towards sustainable economy or circularity, or all these terms that are you know, pretty much referring to the same thing, which is that resources should be staying in use as much as they can and you know, just kind of close the loop that we're talking. But us, we try to go a little bit beyond that and start saying that not only do we need to close the loop in the economy and close the circles and reuse our materials, but also the loop has to become a lot smaller because even if we tr turn to sustainable production right away with a magic a magic wand and a, and a magic formula that will just turn every type of uh, process, industrial process into something that is sustainable, it was the demand that we're doing and the way that we're consuming is so big and is looking towards such a huge rise that the circle will be just so big that it's just, just as resource intensive. And then we're back in, in step one with the same problem. So here, given that this is a talk about mobility, the great example to this is this, uh, is this one that we really like to use. You know, we know that electrical cars have zero emissions, but if we just leave the solution to be just everyone stop having cars that move with gas and turn them into electric cars, while well, we still have the same problems of people having to live their lives waiting for, for the light to turn green and with huge uh, mobility issues and not being able to mo move from point A to point B. So it's not just beyond, uh, it goes way beyond just looking for a solution in a way that to do things that has less emissions is how we really repurpose the way we think of what we're doing. Uh, why do we talk about household consumptions? Because it has a lot of potential when it comes to uh, diminishing the effects of climate change. Um, household consumption represents up to 70% of the emissions. So definitely if we change what we're needing 
in the terms of what we are consuming, it will definitely have a great impact in the emissions that are, are being, the, in the number of emissions. And then if we just go ahead, uh, but it is not so easy as just saying reduce your consumption. And I specifically in this audience, you will understand because it is very different the way that consumption happens across countries and across contexts. And if we see, for example, here, we're looking at a report made by the NGO called Water Cool, which analyzed the amount of reduction needed uh, in terms of household consumptions in 10 different countries. And then we can see that the way that people emit is vastly different not only in terms of how much they emit, but in terms of where do they, their emissions go. So what does that mean? That we not only need to know how much we have to change, but also we need to know in what sectors it, the, the greatest emissions are happening so that we can have targeted solutions that will really have a bigger impact. So definitely, for example, if you're talking about food, uh, we definitely would not be thinking, even though we know that swapping proteins and eating less uh, animal protein is the greatest solution and the most effective one. Definitely, it shouldn't be a road that a government like India should be taking well, when most of their population is vegetarian already. And then that also comes to leading us to inequality and thinking about how do we need to to think as well about who is the one uh, who is the one emitting. So we know that 50% of the emissions are done by the top 10% of people. So that means that probably even not even most of us here are actually responsible or even over overdoing the way that they're consuming. But there is a big issue with that because those great em emitters are the ones setting up our aspirations and they're kind of making it so that we're supposed to desire the way they are living that is incredibly harmful to the planet. So all of the other have to wish and aspire to have a lot of cars, to have private air, airplanes that transport them everywhere. And uh, so these kind of expectations that are not really healthy or helpful to the planet are the ones that are being portrayed as, as desirable. So definitely uh, the other 90% of people with their strength in numbers should be questioning those others and pressuring them to change the way uh, and all the harm that they're doing. So as well, um, it also leads us to the way we speak to others about reducing their consumption. We know that in bigger terms, we need to reduce emissions and reduce consumption. But in no way can we forget that there are many people, many, many billions of people that do not have their basic needs met. And therefore they are not responsible and should not be taking blame for the actions of others. And as well, you cannot approach them to talk about sustainability from a narrative of restriction and sacrifice and asking them to reduce the way they're, uh, they reduce the things they're doing and even kind of refuse to aspire to better, better prospects in their living because uh, they have not even had access to what is basically needed to live. So what kind of messages should we do? Should we give them? Does that mean they should not be working towards a, a better uh, future or kind of working for a more sustainable life? Yes, so therefore we have to expect them first to consume more to meet their basic needs. But we, what we should have to strive for is that they meet their basic needs from the get-go in a sustainable way. And that in a way, and in a sense, also coming from Colombia, uh, when you think about coming from uh, countries that are emergent economies, countries that are developing just now, we are in a privileged position because we can go ahead and develop sustainably from the get-go. We don't have to submit ourselves to replicate models that we know are unsuccessful and harmful, but we can directly go ahead and think of our future as a sustainable one.
And then we continue uh, talking about what are sustainable lifestyles. And then again, they're not lifestyle, they're lifestyles, they're in plural, because their lifestyles depend on when you are. To, to have a sustainable lifestyle is very diff different in Africa than it is here in Europe. Um, but basically what we need to strive for is a way of living that has the least impact possible, the least impact possible. So that means a whole different thing for someone who's li lived in a consumer society or for someone who lives in a context in which they don't have good um, waste management. So it means just to think and to start to have a conscious consciousness about what we have, the resources we get, and how we can better profit them so that we can have a better future for ourselves. So as well, it's kind of turning in to the positive side and how a, a more sustainable life, lifestyle can make us happier and can make us healthier and can give us a lot more well-being than certain aspirations that have been sold to us. So as well, that means that they have to be accessible and they have to be available for all because our de definition has a special add-on, which is that they have to be the least impactful lifestyle, but as well, they have to support socioeconomic and equitable uh, development for everyone. So it's not just thinking about us and our personal situations, but it's thinking of us within a system and within a community that can be helped as a whole, not really, which is kind of goes against the sort of um, narrative of capitalism that talks about personal success, is about thinking uh, about success as something that is for a whole community and not really for a personal or familiar basis. How do we get to sustainable lifestyle? Well, it's a hard road. We're step-by-step step moving. However, what we need to, we put a, an emphasis on is information and how all of the changes and all of the new behaviors and all of the advocacy has to always be based on the science. We know what is it that works. We have re reports, we have resources. So therefore we need to keep um, moving forward with the scientific development that we have gotten all over the years that is really clear and has really clear objectives on, on where we have to go. Everything has to be science-based. Therefore, we cannot, we avoid situations as the previous slide of the uh, magical solutions of the electrical cars and start thinking a little bit deeper and not allow ourselves to be deceived by seemingly easy solutions that are not really going to change things in the long run. So what we were asked was uh, about three years ago was, uh, can you really tell us and study what is it that people can do? Because we know uh, what causes the effects. For example, we know that 80% of biodiversity loss is due to food systems, however, what does that mean to me? Like, what is that? Like, does that mean I'm not in, I'm eating the wrong things? Does that mean we, we can have the, the way we're doing agriculture is more? Uh, so what we basically did was start to reach out to all of the sectorial es experts, to all of our uh, colleagues that had done a lot of research and start thinking about what is it that we can do specifically and then how is it that we can change the way we do it? So we started uh, investigating about why do people consume? Why do people make the choices they make? Everyone, and this is something that is true, everyone makes decisions every day in terms of money, in terms of what they do. However, they are conditioned by their context, by the amount of resources they have, by the culture they're in, uh, by their personal situation, by, by, by the, their age, by the fact that they just had a baby. So things are always shifting and there are many reasons. And we're trying to push, well, with a very good intention that people put sustainability 
as one of the drivers for their choices. However, we cannot really expect that because how can you ask somebody to um, have to look for the most sustainable product when they don't they don't even know if they're gonna eat at night? So both people are just trying to get by and get their living done and pay the rent at the end of the month. So what we need to, to strive for is that the sustainable choice, that the most sustainable service is, the, is available, is affordable, and it is uh, something that anyone can choose. So it is because people do care about the environment. If you ask anyone, they care, they're worried. However, there are so many other things that come as a priority so that they don't cannot actually act in accordance to that desire. So there goes the behavior action gap. They cannot choose to be sustainable. And what we need is that is not a choice that they have to consciously make and, and an effort or a sacrifice, but it is the choice that is the most convenient for everyone. And then, uh, so we think of that, and then we think about what is the most effective. We know anyway that the most effective thing uh, to combat this three planetary crisis starts with re reduce, reducing what we use. So basically the best thing you can do is not to buy at all. So basically first thing, just, so what does that require from us? To start to be more conscious about the decisions we're making. Is this that we're buying actually something we need? But then again, we of course do not need to stop buying it uh, at all. You know, of course we'll need things, we we'll need food, we we'll need uh, clothes. So then we start thinking about how can we meet those needs without harming so much, doing so much harm with the environment. And in that way, I also feel that looking at societies like the African societies, like the Latin American societies, like some Asian societies can be key because we are resourceful. We move from what we've got. We have uh, initiatives here that are just basic survival skills that are now being thrown out here as great business models for new opportunities to, to be more sustainable. Things like sharing appliances uh, and then kind of moving forward from that being something that you do out of necessity to be something that means you're helping the world. So it's also a recognition to the things that we do that are right. So as well, there has to be that other side of not only changing to have better behaviors in terms of consumption, but also recognizing the things that we're doing right. And then we went to what can you do? And the, after all of this research, this was all research to have uh, descriptions and, and, and definitions that are official, that are UN based. And we came up with this uh, campaign that is targeted to people. It's called the Anatomy of Action. And it talks about, um, it, is, it is the image of the anatomy is a hand because it talks about what is in our power and in our hands to change. And it applies to everyone, which is the most important because we're talking uh, even in, in any context, people have to eat, they have to clothe themselves, they have to move, they have to spend money and they, have, they, they hopefully have fun. So, what is it that we can do to consciously do that and do it in a way that leads us to a more sustainable lifestyle? So we do it as th in this way as well, not only because it, it's easier to understand, but it's also a way to reach out to new audiences and start in a way translating all that science into something that we feel that empowers us and really leads us to a change and a new way of thinking uh, the way we make decisions and choices. And then as well, we realized that it, it ended up working for a lot of other things. And not only is it a, a good tool for the individuals, but it also is a good tool for policymakers and for business, uh, for business leaders, because 
yes, we as people have to make those choices, but as well, all of the policymakers and business owners should be looking and how do are they uh, contributing to having a system that allows people to make the right choice. So it is a lot about thinking about our own power as individuals, but then that also leads to recognizing that there are many things that are out of our hands and recognizing how is it that a role in the system could start to think and lead us to uh, foster like more systemic change that involves other stakeholders is never about people. One person is not going to save the world. And definitely, if we join forces in recognizing that I'm um, getting together to require uh, businesses to give us the right products and services and require our local, even at a local level, uh, that all the projects are done thinking about the way they foster the best of our well being. It is a different uh, intent on the way we're living in this world. So here are the five um, sectors and each one of the of the actions. We have three ranges of actions per sector. They're also uh, organized in terms of impact, the most impactful first, so that people know what is it, the, what is the thing that they should be focusing on. And then, you know, I tell you, you also can think about it within your context. So, you know, if you're thinking about food and you're a vegetarian, you can probably focus on managing better your waste, your food waste. Or if you're talking about um, if you have if you ride a bike, so you should you're probably all set for move for mobility. So you know it's kind of thinking it within your context. For example, money. It is hard sometimes for people to get it because they think, you know, we're talking about, you know, leading a big investment and funding a renewable energy projects. But no, it, it, it can be as simple as uh, I'm going to get a coffee uh, or should I get it from a, from a chain restaurant or should I just go to my local cafe? It's kind of where, what, what are you picking? Can, do you go to the big supermarket or is there a, a small market of local suppliers happening every Sunday that maybe it takes a little more time because you have to go on a different day and look for other things. And, but it, it is there, they are, what we're basically doing is trying to build a movement. Uh, when it comes to mobility, I want to focus a little bit on that due to the, the subject of, of the conference. It basically talks about uh, the most important way you can uh, you can help out is to choose a non-motorized transport. Afterwards, sharing your ride, and then if you're actually gonna uh, have a particular mode of transport, uh, it, it choose the cleanest option. And then, well, here um, looking at it also talks about a shift of aspirations as well, because, you know, when we talk about transport, it, it's shown that the thing that we should look for is that kind of very big American way shown in the movies of huge cars in which you drive off <laughs> and drive out in the sunset and connect with nature and are free and can see the world. And it's kind of a, a show of success and status. However, when we actually see the reality of mobility around the world, especially since it's mostly based on, on uh, personal vehicles, we see that actually uh, you know, traffic is a mess. Um, most of the cars are actually parked about 95 percent of their useful life lifetime so you know basically even though people have their own it's freedom to move they the actually the cars remain still at most of the time uh, and then of course the amount of emissions that are being that, that are caused by mobility around the world and then uh, as well thinking about how the cities that we're talking about here in Africa, 
that they are in a stage in which we could prevent that kind of reality in a sense, in terms of how as the cities grow, there should be better planning that also integrates other modes of transportation. And for example, works around the fact that you have such a big number of non-motorized transport and integrates it into a uh, well-serving public transportation that can allow people to get everything they need um, dutifully and in affordable ways and being able to reach out other places, but without having to think of this a chaos methods that are, seem kind of inevitable because cities end up being constructed around the car and not really around the person. So therefore, that's why we have the three actions, starting by keeping active and using non-motorized transport, uh, sharing your ride, preferring public transportation, and then in case you have to do like a longer trip in a private way, choose the cleanest route. Then I wanted to share a couple of, of good actions, uh, you know, selected from Africa. Uh, the Car Free Day, which are good uh, examples. And that really makes, makes us think about what, what is the priority when it comes to planning cities in terms of, of mobility. Because then we see how people can actually have good experiences moving around in their bikes, moving around uh, on feet because there are no cars uh, menacing their, their experiences in the road, which is really important. Uh, we always think about development as building a big road, but as well, we need to think about how is it that we think around moving without having a car? And how is it that the aspiration has to be for everyone to move around in a car and not really to have spaces in which we can find things that everything we need in close proximity and allows us to move and have and meet our needs without having to either buy a car or even we, we should be striving for not even having to buy a bus bus anyway, even if it's a little bit hard. Still, we, we, we should be able to move a little bit further than that, but probably that hopefully that, that does not mean that we need to undertake um, a high emitting alternative. Um, so we have all those examples, and then we also have the results of our campaign. We are very focused on, on you know, betting on social media because what we want is to spread the message and also to be inclusive with the message. We've managed to reach up to 22 million people, and we have had participation from all regions in the UN. We had a specific, uh, very, very interesting uh, um, activation of, of the anatomy on fashion in Africa, in which we talk about the way uh, textile production works here and how to think of a more sustainable uh, textile industry in the region. And then as well, we try to translate materials as well to as much languages as we can. And then we also take the message further. Uh, since uh, a lot of you are working towards more sustainable uh, transportation, I would like to recommend if you have the chance to see our policy brief, Enhancing Sustainable Lifestyles in a Climate Emergency, that talks about policymakers' choices that they can do. It uses a framework called choice editing and lifestyle, so it goes through the sectors, and it talks about how policymakers have to edit out uh, harmful choices, which for example, would be a, a measurement like the one they just had in Europe, like banning gas cars, which you know it's a little bit, we, we can talk about it if you have any of the questions. And uh, edit in good, good options. So for example, uh, having better cyclable roads and better uh, lanes for people to walk in. And basically do that in, in every domain and have concrete strategies for more sustainable cities. And then we also have the Sustainable Lifestyles Academy, 
in which we're working on directly on tools to for people to learn about lifestyles. We have a, a game that we designed and that we're going to have a global rollout of the game next year in which people can compete and answer questions and learn about lifestyles. But most importantly, they also have to act and show people that they're taking on more sustainable behaviors. And then uh, we're doing a course on sustainable lifestyles that hopefully will be launched by February. And that one is easier because it's open for everyone. So if anyone is interested in, in using it as a resource, as a teaching resource, as an intermediate resource, you know, go ahead and and and, and reach out. Uh, here's all my information. If, if you want to follow us on Instagram, uh, of course, you're welcome. We're always looking to keep on <laughs> spreading the message and getting in touch with as, as much people as we want. Uh, we've had people uh, redo the anatomy in their universities, in their local communities. So if you if that looks like a, uh, an option, like we, we would love to hear from you. Uh, but basically is that to kind of take on a more conscious role in the way we make choices and recognize ourselves within the system that we're living.